Unit 6, this is our section part, part B, um, where the first part was about cowboys and Indians and miners. This one we're going to be focusing on railroads and farmers. Um, please notice there are a lot, a lot of state standards that are, a lot of these indirectly, um, but some of them directly with, with this section um, that we have. Our time periods we're focusing on with this, some of this before the Civil War, but after the Civil War. And one thing about this, we're not going to have as many just concrete um, time periods that you have, but it'll be the change over time, what happens over several decades. Okay, the train from eight, from basically the end of the Civil War to sometime in the 1920s, it will be the most powerful industry for all of the United States. Um, there, um, Starting in the, from the 1920s to about the 1990s, it'll be the automobile, and then since the 1990s, more technology. There. When I say it's the most, the biggest one, other industries are intertwined with it. Yes, the steel industry was huge, but the number one customer for steel industry was the railroad industry. Our mining, but coal was used for the railroads, and we have for agriculture and industry. All these were linked together because of the railroads. One reason for this expansion, and it started in the Civil War where there was government assistance, but there are going to be huge land grants and deals to encourage the expansion of the railroads on there. And the railroads are going to change America on there. It's going to change the way we shop. It's going to change the way we farm. We're going to have it where certain areas are going to be specializing in things and we can be interconnected. It's going to change time itself, as you're going to see from this section. All right, the Transcontinental Railroad. Going back to 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, where Stephen Douglas was making, were the first railroad to go from the east to the west on um, there. So you see connecting California with it, that will transverse the continent, was completed in 1869. The Golden Spike was done outside of Salt Lake City, a place called Promontory Point, Utah. Most of the construction of this railroad was done by immigrants, and a lot of, and this our railroad at this time, there were a lot of the immigrants that would die. Um, there we're going to see on a video for on America's Story of Us that will show some of the things with it. But uh, Irish immigrants worked a lot on the, the railroads that were going from east to west, Chinese that were going from the west to the east. Um, by the end of that century, we will have four others, not to mention a lot of other railroads that are connected together. Now this map is shown in 1870, so I like this map because this is kind of right on the verge of when the when we will have a ton of the railroads done, but the first transcontinental one is completed. Notice how much more interconnected the north is. The south will become more interconnected, and we're going to see a little bit later on where in Florida we're going to have down the east coast, we're going to have the flag line, we're going to have the plant line, uh, we're going to have lines that are connected here, and the spurs that were made on it. Florida's going to be a little bit behind some of the areas, actually even in the west, but the 1890s and early 1900s is when it will boom in Florida. Okay, I said that, that a, lot of, a lot of the railroads were helped by the federal government um, here. And this is where what they did is they gave loans to it. But the biggest thing that they would have is for lands. They would be allowed if they built, built areas, uh, railroads, that they would have a certain number of mileage. So if it's an area that maybe was good, good farmland, they would get five miles um, on one side of it. Or if you see on this map in the middle of the screen there, that checkerboard. So they would get a, a certain part of, of the area. Um, where I say there was a lot of fraud that, that occurred um, in here, this is where sometimes the best land the railroads got um, there. We have cases of bribes that were done. We have things that maybe weren't even fraud, but where they would take advantage. If they were an area that had rich land that they knew was going to be worth a lot, instead of making a straight line, they would curve it. So um, something that could have been 25 miles in a straight line, they can make this to 27 miles, and then they get more acreage out of it. Um, we will have our, our biggest economic downturns will occur for things for the railroads and one of um, in the late 1800s. One of them was the Panic of 1873, which started with the Credit Mobilier scandal. Okay, this next part um, in here, this is one thing that I add. You're probably not going to see it in the textbook, other history teachers. This is one of the few things that, that I want you to know about because... General Henry Washburn was part of the Army Corps of Engineers when they were surveying this land out west and trying to plot what were the best places for railroads to go. And he and, a, and his team went and spoke in front of Congress and told them, don't build in the railroad line. Set this land aside, which at that time was not something that was seen as normal. Um, 
And he told him, I want my grandchildren, I want my great great grandchildren to see what I saw. And after he did this, this is when we will have the first national park, which is Yellowstone. And that is why today, if you go to Yellowstone, you can see what um, General Washburn saw uh, 150 years ago or so. Alright, this is a question I like, I like to point out, and this is where we haven't got the homesteading yet, but that is definitely for one of the answers to throw you off. Um, there's several things in here that makes this a harder question. It says in the period between the end of the Civil War and the beginning of the 20th century, some people will get mixed up when you see 20th century, write 1900s on there, which of the following received the largest amount of federal lands. Hopefully you know it's not the Indians because we weren't giving them much land. B and C are both both technically right, but C is the better answer. And then homesteading, where we're going to have a whole section about homesteads here at the, um, in the end, you're, you're going to see, see with that one how that can be used as a distraction for you. All right, the railroads, they got that land. What do they want to do? They want to sell it. Now, they actually sold it for pretty cheap um, there because what they wanted is people to settle. If they sold it for cheap, they got some money, but the people that settled would have to use their railroad um, there. So a lot of the selling that they would do um, would, would be to, to people that could buy it for cheap. They would settle there, have to buy their supplies, and then the crops they grew um, coming back and forth. But there wasn't enough in America, and they were actually advertised in Scandinavian countries, Germany. And a lot of these were not your poorest immigrants that you would have. Um, I actually had some family that was in that moved to that little dot there in Kansas um, in there that came in 1867 from Sweden um, there. What happened was it was the father had a, a farm but there was not enough land for the two sons um, to have it so one of the sons that took over the family farm the other one with a little bit of money would then come to to America and settle uh, there. Notice on this map how dark this area this map is showing of Scandinavian which a lot of Scandinavian people from Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland that moved here and you kind of think about for Minneapolis um, and there the Minnesota Vikings the reason why they have the nickname is because of so many Scandinavians that, that moved there um, also with immigrants again a lot um, the Irish and the Chinese were ones that did a lot of the building of it but there were other immigrants that were working on the building of the immigrants okay time itself changed because what will happen is we will establish time zones before that it was locally done uh, the mayor of Inverness would set the town clock. Everybody would go by, that cl by the time there that the mayor had. Um, it didn't really matter because if, let's say, you were to travel um, 20 miles from here to Ocala, if you were to telegraph and say you, you had an appointment, you would say, I'd be coming afternoon because you don't know exactly how long your horse and everything is going to take you. But the railroad didn't run that way. They wanted things exact. So what happened on November 18th, 80, 1883, time would literally change um, there. And you didn't know, go, go by Inverness time. Train left New York and it set the time. We will then set the, the, the time zones and what we use today um, there. Um, the professor that had this, C.F. Dowd, was the one that came up with his plans. But uh, I like to show just how much railroad was dominating all kinds of aspects of people's lives. Okay, the Pullman sleeper cars, um, you can see some of the pictures of it. For normal people, you, most of you think of like what you would ride in would be like a bus, maybe more like a Greyhound type bus that you would have. So you would have cars if you're traveling long distance that a bunch of people would be in. But if you were richer, they had these cars, which you had little sleeping compartments. You may have seen these in different movies or TV shows at time um, in there. So this is where one of those, those side industries, today we have very few very few of those that are that are around so it's not an industry we have uh, made and, and that's why I said that we have these side industries where the railroads one of the biggest um, when we get to strikes in the labor part one of the biggest strikes that will happen will be in a company town that the Pullman had their factory what the company town was was people that worked in the factory also lived in that town so they worked for the factory but they paid their rent bought their stuff for stores all owned by who they worked for town for Dowd, he's one that made time zones. Okay, for Florida, um, you're going to, to have a lot of times an EOC question because this is where we can make a question for, for Florida. Now, we have three different people that were making railroads in Florida, but the most common one used is Henry Flagler. I know for us on the West Coast, we, like, we, we, we don't like that fact of it. If you live on the East Coast, like where I used to live down in South Florida, you see Flagler off all kinds of things in here. 
He built, built his railroad line that actually went all the way down the Key West. Uh, that, then we had in the central part of Florida and the west coast was connected, Henry Plant built it. We had a third railroad line that was built by A. Chipley um, that went across and connected Pensacola. From these we had different spurs of different railroad lines. Um, eventually the east coast railroad would end up controlling most of those railroad lines that, that we have in there. And then what they did is they built these luxury hotels. If you see this, this building might look familiar to some of you. If you go to University of Tampa right off the Hillsborough River, that was the Plant Hotel. It was a fancy hotel that he had. Um, what is today part of Flagler College in St. Augustine was, was part of the, the hotels that Henry Flagler had, which he built them down to, the, like one of those is the Breakers down in Palm Beach. Um, this was an exclusive hotel that he had in Miami, which is now gone. But this is where, where we, they would have these railroad lines um, in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Here's a map shown with some of the different railroad lines, and again, they were connected together. Um, Henry Flagler, again, would buy some of these smaller railroad lines that were already there. One thing the railroad lines did when they came to Florida, we will have a lot of tourists. You see right here in our own county, um, where Grover Cleveland used to come to Home Assassin to go fishing. That's why we have um, Grover Cleveland Boulevard, uh, if you know where the Home Assassin Library is, the soccer fields are off of that area going in there where he was one of several presidents that, that came and would, would fish and hunt um, on Home Assassin. And then you see the Railroad Depot. If you're in Dade City, um, you, it's still around there for tourists. Henry Flagler will have his railroad eventually go all the way down to the Keys. Um, engineering wise, he was told it, it was not possible to do, which he was a rich man who he was going to do, do it even if he told him he couldn't. And they had all kinds of different styles of bridges depending on what the formation was underneath it. But this is one of the, the bridges that we have that connected it. Alright, this does not seem real exciting, but it actually is really important. Um, the post office has always been very important for the United States. That's why um, even today with arguments that we have about the Postal Service and where, where, what should be done and the political side of this, but it has been something that going back to the beginning of our country with Benjamin Franklin, um, we had the best Postal Service even when we were colonies. But this is where it changed shopping because what was called rule-free delivery will make it where even if you live somewhere out in the far away that you would have things that could be delivered to you even if you were on a rural route um, there. And so what would happen is the, it, and, it, and it cost, and the, the cost was a lot less um, there. And even today, this is where a first class mail, it costs the same for me to mail a letter to Ocala, that's 20 miles away, uh, if I was to mail a letter to Portland, Oregon, um, there, and that's 3,000 miles away um, there. But what will happen is people can shop, and we're going to have another part about mail order catalogs. So if you lived in the middle of South Dakota, you could look through a Sears catalog or a Montgomery Ward catalog, and you could order something, and the post office would bring it to you. And when I say anything, I mean anything. We'll see a, a video um, that tells about how this started up with with Sears with, with watches, but I know I have a shotgun that I bought that bought that's an antique Sears shotgun. You could buy a house, literally a kit that you could build a house that would come on the railroad um, there from, from Sears and Roebuck um, here. But and that's where the rule free delivery. Today you kind of think about it how Amazon is, where the except for you instead of using a mail order catalog, you can order it online and then either the post office or UPS or Federal Express will bring the products to you on there. And this is something that, again, for America, changed the way that we shopped. It was no longer just going to, if you're in a little town, what the, what the store had on there. You could get other things. All right, so what's happening in the, in the South and, and here? This is where, where the main thing that's happening is segregation. We have sharecropping for a lot of them, the crop lien system, tenant farming. Um, and here, the, what is called the New South with uh, Jim Crow laws, Plessy versus Ferguson made, made the separate but equal uh, allowed. But what ended up happening was after the Civil War, the price of cotton went down. So what are you going to grow? And this is where at um, George Washington Carver, who is a professor at the Tuskegee Institute, um, he tried to find various things that can make for stuff that grows good. I have on there like and basically peanuts was the example. He's usually known as the peanut guy, but it wasn't just peanuts. 
he found where corn still grew good in the south. What were other products that can be made from corn um, there? But peanuts grew good in a lot of soil that had been depleted from, from decades of cotton. So that's why he's most famous for peanut, especially peanut butter. And George Washington Carver, uh, Booker T. Washington was the person that founded the Tuskegee Institute. In the New South, this is where we still, where so much was based on raw products. May not be cotton anymore, it may be timber, it may be other things. But Henry Grady, and I know I had this in the Reconstruction section, but Henry Grady had written that the South needs to be self-sufficient, they need to have diversity, they need to, if they're growing cotton, have textile mills. The problem that the, the South had was they did not have the capital to build those type of factories. And so a lot of things that had to be done was when Northerners moved here. Um, Florida is a great example. Talk about those railroads um, where Rockefeller and Plant were, were Northerners that came and they will build the hotels and they will make it. And Florida's a little different, but most of the South, the economy would not really change um, from basically reconstruction um, there until after the Great Depression or during the Great Depression with New Deal programs, but then World War II. Most of the land in the Deep South was controlled by the rich, that bourbon rule we talked about before, and again, the New South, sharecropping, segregation, were just basic things that, that were going on um, here. So that's where the, those farmers, they did have some, some, of, the, some of the advancements um, that were made, but not as much as what will happen in other areas. Now, said so the railroads would sell, sell the land as cheap, but a lot of people couldn't afford that. And thus, we will end up having what was seen as one of the greatest acts ever passed in the United States history or laws. You could get a section of land, which was a quarter section or a quarter of a square mile on there, 160 acres of land. Now, you could get it for free. Notice the quotation marks. In order to get it to free, you would have to build a house. You would have to farm at least 10 acres and live on it for at least five years. Now, you didn't have to live on it all year long for five years, but you had to live on it for the majority. Now, some people would go and they would build a house, farm, just put 10 acres, live on it during, from the spring to the fall, and then go back and live in Chicago or Minneapolis, and then they would have a farm afterwards. But for a lot of people, this gave them the opportunity that they needed. Now the house, I don't remember the exact size of it, but it was something like 12 by 12 or 10 by 12 house, which when you're thinking, most of you have bedrooms that are bigger than that on um, there. And what type of house? It didn't define it. Again, it had to be just a structure you're living in it. Again, you're farming 10 acres. Well, most of the people, they were farmers. But once you lived there for five years, that 160 acres became yours that you would have um, in here. Um, we tried also what's called the Timber Culture Act, which we were trying to change um, change the Great Plains and try to start it to make it a forest. That was not very successful um, in there. And and if you ever read the Little House on Prairie books, this is where you could, could read both about the homestead and what happened with the timber culture um, there with with Laura Ingleballer's husband who tried with the Timber Culture Act. Now, the one thing about the Homestead Act is part of the idea for an American dream. You had a chance to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. This was, some people say, the greatest welfare program we ever had because you could be self-sufficient in there. If you, are, if you were willing to work hard, you could possibly be successful um, in there for the farmer. Here's an area that you see that, that is for Wisconsin, where I told you that they plotted it. So these are all, those are six by six miles, which then they would go, go in there for the miles and go to quarter sections, and they plotted out the land. So large areas of that that were able to be got, gotten from the Homestead Act in there. Talked about the house, okay, you, there was various houses. You see some of these pictures on it. Some of these are pretty straightforward. A sod house is built out of sod. A dug, dugout would be like this one here that you dig inside of a, of the hill and you pretty much are living in a cave um, in there. Um, it was very isolated for some of these these areas that you have and for a lot of areas it would be men that went and, and moved there and so yes there would be some families but a lot of times you might be on a farm that's three four or five miles away from the nearest town there's only a few other homesteads within a couple of miles of you they may all be male so for a woman sometimes um, they, they did not get an opportunity to see other grown women, um, except for maybe if they went into town um, there or went to church or something. 
So it was a very hard life for these women. Um, where we saw also some of the things for the cowboys and the west uh, and and how the western towns came about but this is where women that women that survived out in the west were seen as extremely tough and they were the first places to get suffrage wyoming was our first state to allow it um, in here now we will have a lot of advancements some of this started before the civil war um, in there but then they were made more john deere did not make the first plow they've been around for thousands of years but he will use um, a new technique and he will also use a lot of Carnegie still to make one that is lighter and sharper and one that could rip through in the planes in there. Cyrus McCormick will make what's called the mechanical reaper. Originally people would have, you think like the grim reaper to cut the, the things. And here's a real really old style one, it's a small one that's all by horse and like something like that could end up doing the work of like five people. They had known that they started making them where they were powered by steam engines. Today, a, the Reaper is on the, on the front of a, of a combine. It combines the Reaper with what is called a thresher. We will have machines that are going to do seeding. We're going to have steam engines run this. What happens overall, though, is one farmer is able to do a lot more with technology. And this is where we will definitely be changing over, over time. We will go from from the beginning of our country where nine out of 10 people were farmers to today less than 2% um, there. But the late 1800s is when a lot of these advances will be done in here. And if you order some of that, you could get it brought to you by the rule free delivery. You can get all kinds of supplies brought to you where you can, can go and order on that. I mentioned before the Sears and Robox ca catalog or Montgomery Ward. And again, you could, even if you lived in the country, you could buy these things and then they're going to be brought to you by trains and by the post office with rule of free delivery. One of the side effects, and this is kind of jumping ahead, but this is where you see cause and effects. The Homestead Act, when it was built, we will go through a climate change um, in there. We go through cycles. In the late 1800s, um, in there, we will, it, we will have it where it's a above average for seasonal rain. So some areas that maybe shouldn't have been farmed were able to be farmed for the rain um, there. Then we will go to the opposite. We will go to a very dry cycle for several years in a row. And when we get to the Great Depression, we're gonna see what's called the Dust Bowl. But this is where the Homestead Act will have a lot of people come and start farms in areas that aren't. We're going to have to fix this environmental disaster that we created, and it'll be one of the things that is done during the New Deal. Um, have a mixture of things for agriculture. We're going to, to have um, land-grant colleges that, that are, are made. Um, what a land-grant college was is it was a way to try to teach people to be better farmers. Normally you learned how to farm from your dad. Well, what if your dad wasn't very good? So we will have, and even today, we're here in Florida, we have the University of Florida is, was established as an agriculture school. That's why it went to Gainesville. Um, the University of Florida was actually four different schools that were located, some in Ocala, some in Lake City, um, and then one in Gainesville, and then they centerized all of them, and that's where, even today, you have, you have a pasture in the middle of the University of Florida in Gainesville, and it's one of the top agriculture schools in America on there. But they have extension offices where if you are a farmer, or even if you are trying to have an aviator with bees, that they will have experts that come and try to help you. And that's what the Morrell um, Grant Land Grant Colleges did there. The other thing that was attempted at that time that we, we don't have, we, we'll, which is a lot like how agriculture is today, is what we call bonanza farms. And with the bonanza farms, these were giant farms and like corporate type farms. Um, and they ended up not being successful because of the prices dropped too much and a, dro a lot of drove drove a lot of them out of business um, at the time. Another thing that we have, and this is where a term you need to know is cooperatives. Now, if you grew up in the Middle West, you would know about co-ops and there. And what happened is farmers joined together and when they need a certain supplies, like today, if you, the co-ops, you see these giant things are called grain elevators. They will store their grain and then they will be able to sell it. And since more of, instead of each individual farmer working on a contract with the company, a group of farmers then with a, with a large amount of grain are able to sell it. And then for buying things like for diesel or gas, they can then work out contracts and buy a large amount that we have in here. Now, at the same time period in our next section, we're gonna have about unions. The unions are graining strength. And this is a lot of the same. It's the, Co cooperatives were farmers that were joining together with a common purpose 
um, and there and going against a lot of the the uh, major businesses or at least having that trying to get a fair say with them and unions will be doing the same with labor that's working in the factories um, this is a commercial that University of Florida has um, showing showing about and you actually use them with the Morrell Act in theirs all right this is going to be pretty straightforward but what you must know overall farmers are going to have two major problems um, in there that they have the first problem is with the railroads now what their problem is is the shipping charges or freight charges there if you lived in a farm uh, let's say you're in Nebraska and there's one farm that comes into your town you have to pay the prices that that farm has and they know it you're growing all this corn it has to be shipped out by their railroad so if they charge you extremely high prices you had no choice you had to pay it um, in here so this is where we will have um, have the farmers that are, are kind of stuck by them what ends up happening is we will have this court case this is one of about 10 court cases you must know not be familiar with must know in here which would say that there could be some regulation of business and that and we're gonna have the Interstate Commerce Act that, that will be passed and this will back it up on um, there so this is a case where where government could regulate a business where before we were laissez-faire and saying to each their own but what well, they said if it's something essential to the livelihood of it today it will affect you um, in here not because you're a farmer but this case will mean for electricity um, in there um, and it's you may you you only have probably one choice of where you get your electric from unless you are off the grid or you are using your own generator or totally solar or something and if like the majority of people at ours have duke duke energy that has that has our, has a power company if duke energy wants to raise up their electric um charges for you they're allowed to do it but they have to go from the state of florida utilities commission and tell why they're raising it up so if they say they're going to raise it up five percent because we had some hurricanes and they used up their emergency funds and they need to buy more or they're going to be be doing things they have to give a reason for why they're raising they just can't raise it up because electricity is seen as essential just like the railroads were seen as essential for these farmers so number one problem is the railroads um, in there the interstate commerce act i mentioned that will be what will make it where there is more regulation mun versus illinois will uphold it again no mun versus illinois problem number two is the banks what farmers had to do is they had to a lot of times get a loan in the spring to get them through the season and then they would pay it off with with the, when they harvested their crops but if you had two or three bad years in a row uh, they weren't able to pay out their crops you would have a, a lot of foreclosures or you see these evacuation sell signs I'm um, in here now also they, the banks knew the farmers had to have this so they would charge extremely high rates um, higher rates than they would for other businesses um, that, that they would have and so farmers were kind of stuck with, with them um, farmers would like to have inflation now I'm gonna go through a whole thing in class showing about how things are with and what your trust is with government with money and that but they would like inflation which means the price of everything going up because if they had inflation they're gonna be paying back their loans with inflated dollars um, in there so they wanted the prices to go up Greenback Party will be one of the early third parties and we're going to have some others in there. The Greenbacks, Greenbacks the name for money. They wanted paper money that was done in here. Later on, we're going to have the People's Party or the Populist Party that supports bimetallism and wanted our, our dollars back not only by gold but by silver too. Now, we're going to have these farmers organizations. I'm going to lump all these together, but this is where, where you're, when you see the word Grange um, in there, that's the major one we have. Um, Oliver Kelly will start the Patrons of Husbandry, which will later on merge with the Grange. It was a social organization um, for farmers, but really quickly it became a political one. Some was like how the KKK was, but it will not become a terrorist organization like the KKK. Um, one of the things they will do is to, those cooperatives we talked about. They will they will then use it to start cooperatives so they can negotiate and buying and selling um, in here. But here's where they would really go and they would have these Granger laws or cases. They would use it as a lobby organization and they would try to go and have it where, where they have their fight against the railroads and for the banks um, in here. And one of the most famous cases we have besides the Munn case there is the Wabash case, which originally they said the states couldn't interstate, couldn't regulate, but the federal government could then under the Interstate Commerce Act 
and that's why MUD versus Illinois is important. But that's where the Grange groups were the ones that made these laws, and they're the ones that brought these cases to it. Another group that's very similar to this is called the Farmer Alliance. It's a little bit after the Grange. They will meet in 1890 nearby in Ocala. They will have a platform for what they call for. They were a little bit ahead of their time. This is in 1890, but some of the things that they were calling for will happen in the early 1900s in the progressive movement. The income tax, what will be our 16th amendment, um, will come about after 1910. Direct election of senators, our 17th amendment, um, will happen also in the, in the 19-teens. And there, lower tariffs, we're going to have the have tariffs lower after the turn of the century. And we'll have the Federal Reserve st start um, in there, which is a banking system. So all these things were called for in 1890. They'll occur, most of them, about 20, 25 years later. But this idea starts with these groups of farmers in here. The party that will then emerge from the greenbacks, the populace, uh, will be the populist party um, in there. The Grange, the Farmer Alliance, all of this will merge into the populist party in here. Now, it's a coalition of farmers from the west and the south um, in there. They're going to be loosely together with factory workers um, in here. There's going to be some problems. main problem that's going to be is segregation because when they would have a national convention and farmers from the west and the south got together and the southern farmers said, that the, the blacks couldn't be in the same room. The Western farmers kind of look at them strangely and say, wait a minute, um, don't they have the same problems that we have with the banks and the, the railroads? Should they be there? Uh, their biggest election that they have in that most people know of is the 1896 election, but there actually a lot of it was, a, was four years before. They just have more publicity for the 1896 election. One thing that about the, the Grange and then also the Populist Party is where you're going to have women that are involved. Again, farmers in the West, women, women were seen more as equals in the West. Mary Lease is an example of one of the major leaders in this, this party in here. A lot of what they push for is not going to pass in 1892 or 1896, but again, it'll be later on, 20 years later, will be the biggest impact. But these ideas that are planted at that time for it. In Florida, again, we have the, the uh, Ocala platform, but we have the Democratic Party will adopt a lot of the things that end up happening. We're going to have the Board of Health that has started, Railroad Commission. We're going to have laws against rebates, which this is where the railroad companies could give to it. One thing that is different about the populism in Florida than, than most other areas, here where you see on the bottom, I say try to lure Chinese workers to Florida. Um, there, Most of the places there was actually anti-immigrant, but we needed workers in Florida for a lot of the, the labor side of our, our vegetables and those crops. Um, where you're going to see for William Jennings Bryan was our, our populist candidate for president in, in the state of Florida. Napoleon Broward was, was seen as a populist candidate even though he was officially a Democrat. That's what Broward County where Fort Lauderdale is named after him. Um, he'd been the former um, sheriff, he was a governor, he was a, a, a senator, but he kind of was a mix of both populism and then the progressivism. We'll have two governors after him that will do much of the same also. Okay, a review because this is not the most exciting, but what you must know. When you see the word grains, you need to automatically think farmers. And then you have to think, what are their two biggest problems? And their biggest problems were with railroads and banks. So the Granger laws were to try to help who? They were with farmers. And what the laws and cases that there helped them? Well, there are laws and cases to try to help them against the railroads and the banks. Have this picture. This is one that has been used at, at various times. And you, as you look closely, you see the farmers. This would be like a Granger type of political cartoon. But you notice the people. The railroads are basically running on the backs of the people um, in here and running over them. The Granger sought to combat. Again, this could be worded where I said freight prices in here. There'll be various ways that that'll be worded in there. All right, 1896 will be the election that that one that you need to be familiar with. If you're an AP, you would go, we'd go really in depth on this. But William McKinley was running for president. He was seen as the gold candidate um, in there. He will run what was called a a front porch campaign which he's really going to use the media he will actually do something that's pretty remarkable because he's going to get three of the richest men together to make sure that he wins the reason why that why we will have rockefeller carnegie and jp morgan join together and support mckinley was they were afraid of this guy 
William Jennings Bryan, one of the youngest people to run for president. He was in, he has just over the age of the, the, the minimum of 35. He was a dynamic speaker. Uh, and what he did is went from place to place. He was originally with the Populist Party, and then the Democrats realized when they nominated him that they didn't have a chance to win um, with it, so they just joined with with uh, Populist, and then, and then they will end up actually even taking over it. That joining together the two parties is called fusion um, in here. The main issue that was actually the election before, but then, um, but then it will also become the main issue in 1896, will be bimetallism, where McKinley says that our dollar should be backed only by gold, um, we, um, Brian will say that it should be by gold and silver um, in here. Brian will give this famous speech about how the rich are, sacri are crucifying the common man on a cross of gold. And again, trying to join together the farmers and the, the factory workers um, in here. And it was a, it's a weird coalition that, that you will have in here. Ultimately, McKinley, and I have on there the gold bugs, but basically the, support that, the people that supported the gold standard will be the one will end up winning um, in here. They'll run again four years later, and once again, McKinley will defeat um, William Jennings Bryan. At that time, the issue is going to be more imperialism. Okay, the book, The Wizard of Oz, not the, the movie um, in there, but the book, The Wizard of Oz, is actually about this time. Um, it was written as an allegory about bimetallism. Follow the yellow brick road. Yellow Brick Road is follow gold, the gold standard um, in there. Silver shoes can take you anywhere. Now, in the movie, I know they become ruby red slippers. That's because of techno color in there. But for the original thing, the silver can take you anywhere, so you want to do silver. Wicked Witch of the East, Wicked Witch of the West. What are the two main things that farmers had a problem with? The Wicked Witch of the East is representing the banks. The Wicked Witch of the West is the, the railroads. For Oz, Oz is seen as either the, the United, for, for the um, William McKinley or Marcus Hanna's his candidate. Dorothy is seen as the United States. The Scarecrow is seen as a representative of the farmer. The Tin Man is representative of the factory worker. The Cowardly Lion is William Jennings Bryan um, here. Um, the Flying R Monkeys that, that you have, that's actually supposed to be the Indians um, there. So all those things that we have for that.